Hi, Michelle. Thanks for being with us. Hi, Lori. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, well, it, you know, you are such a busy woman. You're headed off to Papua New Guinea and you are with the International League of Conservation Photographers. Your work is everywhere. So I just want to pick your brain. Thank you. I'm most, most happy to share. So, so tell us, first of all, what is the International League of Conservation Photographers? It was formed about 10 years ago, and it's a collaboration of some really highly notable photographers. And the mission is to further environmental and cultural conservation through photography. We believe that awe-inspiring photography and the power to tell stories through, you know, solid, good visual content is really important. And a lot of times we'll partner with various um, organizations to go out in the field and tell stories. Um, I'm so proud to be a part of the organization. I mean, there's other marine life experts like David Dubelay, Brian Scarry, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Awe. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's quite the honor to share. But in addition, we also have photographers who specialize in a variety of other things. You know, when it comes to environmental concerns, we have some of the best landscape, bird photographers, reptile, you name it, we've got them. And, and again, the names are highly recognizable. Well, you know, what do you, what do you think about uh, all the work you do? Uh, how, do you think it's going into the right hands? Are people getting it that we need to preserve all these things? That it's so important to preserve cultural and environmental uh, environments, like the na natural environments. Is it getting out there? I I believe that we're we're doing a better job of getting information out there. I mean, it always can use improvement. Um, I I believe again, it's. It has to be combined, you know, it's it's not about, it's mixed media now, so we tell a lot of stories in different ways, you know, whether it's through video or still photography, but it has to be powerful. It has to, in order for it to resonate with the viewer, it's got to catch their attention. So when we go out to tell a story, um, we include not just the beauty shots, I mean, yes, those are important, but we uh, include a lot of the, the touching shots, um, the things that will impact your decision on how you want to go about helping environmental issues. So mm -hmm. some of it's not always so pretty. So give me an example, because I've seen lots of your pretty shots. Give me an example of some of the shots that you've taken that, that get people's attention and it, and, it, and it hits them right where they need to be hit. Well, I think for um, marine life conservation, you know, it's um, destructive practices that impact coral reefs. Um, you can have, you know, gorgeous reef shots from a lot of places, but until you start showing some of the destruction, whether it's from uh, pollutants, um, you know, die off from uh, climate change, those kind of things can be very powerful. Um, and of course, we've all seen a lot of content out there in regards to the marine life itself. I mean, shark finning. I mean, mm -hmm. how powerful is that when you see images of, of a fin shark struggling for its last breath laying on a reef? I mean, those are the kind of things that really, you know, get your attention. Oh. So what, what's, what's one of the shots that you took that just, it, it, it's emblazoned in your mind? Um, you know, I think it's more about some of the other shots that, that photographers in ILCP have taken. Uh, the, the shot that empowers me that I really like to tell a story of actually is a beauty shot. And I was on assignment for Living Oceans Foundation, which is, was founded by Prince Khaled bin Sultan. And they have a group of scientists. He has commissioned one of his vessels that's 223 feet long to spend five to six years going around the globe with these experts in coral reef. And they are taking samples. They're, um, you know, checking for new species. They're checking the health of the reef. And they're combining all of this information, which is valuable information, uh, for the not just the world to see, but for the local communities as well. Uh, this was an amazing project that I got to participate in. And my job was to collect those images uh, 
for the storytelling, for their media outreach. When I went there, I you know, had in my mind, what, what is the story that I want to tell about this particular organization and uh, what they're trying to do? And because it's about coral reefs and I just got my hands on a, on a new lens, uh, the 8 to 15 millimeter fisheye, and mm-hmm. I shoot Canon. And I knew in my mind, what, what was the story I wanted to open up with? And so I took a specific shot that is the circular pattern. It's full 8 millimeter, directly down on a healthy reef. And what it imparts, it almost looks like it's a planet because it's circular. I saw and, that one. That is a great shot. Yeah. And that, you know, what does it say? Well, it says, what if the earth, earth were made of coral? So those are the kind of things that we learn and try and tell stories about. And again, give that branding, give that message, you know, because you can't help but think, well, what if the earth were made of coral? Mm-hmm. So um, that one's particularly uh, special to me from the beauty side. Um, I think the hardest ones I've taken... Um, not on assignment for conservation, but just from a, a personal uh, level was in the Caribbean. And mm-hmm. I started my diving over 30 years ago uh, based out of Miami and going over to the Bahamas quite frequently and stuff. So, And at that time, there were gorgeous reefs and, and there was a lot of health. But I had a chance to go a couple years ago and I could not believe the degradation and trying to get a shot, um, I knew I had to collect both. You know, the reefs that are covered with algae, the impact of, yeah, lionfish are pretty, but they don't belong there. Um, so those are the ones that impacted me the most because of the change in 30 years that have happened to those reef areas. Do you, do you think that there's a disconnect? Because um, we see all these beautiful pictures in the dive magazines and you know they always have these gorgeous photos but then we when we go underwater we're, we are seeing the change and um, some people believe that we are not doing the planet um, any any favors by not portraying the bad stuff and uh, do you think that the dive magazines and operators are they part of the problem in in, in keeping the myth going that everything is go okay well, you know, that's a catch-22 because what, is, what, is, what are the goals of the specific publication that's going out there? And if the goal is to market, you know, holiday diving and that experience, then, you know, you've got advertising issues, you have a lot of things. But the one thing I do like to see in a lot of these publications is that they're starting to dedicate um, at least a story or so or, or mention of environmental issues. Can they do more? Of course they can. Um, there are publications out there that focus more on both the good and the bad. For example, uh, Ocean Geographic magazine published you know, with Michael Oz, now in the United States, and he's pretty hard hitting on a lot of different issues. Yes, there's a lot of beautiful, powerful photography, but he also has specific stories about environmental concerns. So I guess we have to, to be fair, we also have to, we have to look at what the goal and mission of the publication is. Um, you know, could the operators do better uh, with their guests? in talking about issues while guests are visiting or on board a live aboard and talk about some of the things to help educate. I think that, that's definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, a good way to help inform divers as to concerns within a specific region. You've been all over the place. Can you give me some examples of resorts or live aboards that are really doing an incredible job walking down that sustainable pathway? Who's, who's doing... Who's, who's really standing out right now? You know, the first uh, that comes to my mind because of my uh, numerous trips to Papua New Guinea, it is probably one of the places on the planet I'm, I'm most passionate about. And, and you're an expert at it, I might add. <laughs> I'll, I'll be making my 30th trip to Papua New Guinea okay. um, next month. So, but I... Um, 
what really stands out to me is what Willindy Plantation has done on, in Kimby Bay on West New Britain. And they dedicated a part of their property to a research center called Mahonia Nadari. And it's not just a research center. It really is a collaboration with the community. And they have programs that they bring in young students from, from schools. And sometimes they fly them in from the main island over to New Britain and teach them about the marine life and how important it is and, and what beauty they have in their own backyards. Um, that is a powerful way to give back to the community. In addition, they have their locally managed marine areas that, again, they work with the local communities, the, the elders in the villages, um, that help them classify and identify no-take zones. Um, and it's that collaboration. It's not telling them what to do. It's, it's um, participation from, right. from the community. So I think they are... Mahonia Nadari is, to me, just a fabulous example of what can be done. How do they uh, teach or, or, or guide their, their, their clientele? What do they do to help them understand why the resort does what it does to, to protect the environment? Well, I think one of the things that's, that's really important is when guests come to, to Walindi, they always provide, you know, a, a tour of the facilities at Mahoney and Adari. Show them the lab, show them if there's any activities going on, most of the guests are quite welcome to, to go watch. Um, and I've been able to be there when they were giving a class to young uh, children. And they had puppet shows. They, had, they just had a tremendous uh, way to teach these children. So they do share that. And I think that's, you know, again, that's giving the guests additional information uh, about the area and, and what can be done with community collaboration. Well, you know, there, there must be other places around the world that are, are, uh, are doing, doing things. I'm, I'm just trying to track them down. And, and, and what, what I'm finding is that many of these people are very, very quiet about how they approach things. They don't bang on the environmental drum. They are very low-key about what they do. And, and I find this interesting because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful what they do, but it's not, it's not spreading like wildfire through our industry. And that's one of my goals is to have this the spread. So can you give me any other examples of people actually being a little bit more, I don't know, more, more pro progressive in, in actually marketing it? Well, I'll tell you one place that I have not been. I've been diving in the area, and that's the Raja Ampat area in, in West Papua. Uh, but there's a resort there that I have been wanting to go to for a long time now, and I'm bound and determined to get there, and that's Mosul. And I have to say that the owner operators there over, gosh, I think they've been running this operation for well over 10 years. But every time I sit down with them at DEMA uh, or other opportunities or watch their, you know, website, what's happening, they really are doing for a small, very remote resort. They're doing some incredible work. Um, yeah, and very poor and, and very poor internet because you know since since <laughs> I talked to you last, Andy Miners has agreed to uh, come on the summit. Oh yes, yeah. yes. So he's gonna. I, I've been I've been tracking him down. <laughs> yeah, it is it is tough in communicating, uh, you know, with some of those more remote locations. But I think they're the ones that need to be celebrated because they can be really good examples to other small operators through, through over the globe that might say, gee, I can't do this because I'm too small. Take yeah. a look at what Masul is doing. And again, their work with the local communities is, is very good. You know, I mean, again, you have to, you know, when we as divers start ignoring the people who reside on the shorelines, then we're missing something. Um, it's very important to be inclusive. 
Well, this is what keeps coming up is the, uh, the, the only way we're really going to manage our ocean is to, to, man it, to address our coastal communities, address the, the, uh, our impact, and, and not just uh, go in there and tell the locals that they can't do this and they can't do that. What you're saying with the Walindi is that they're, they're collaborating, collaborating with the locals. They're not telling them what to do. And people have to make a living. So uh, all, all of this needs to be um, brought into play, and people are, are need to be, as you say, it has to be participatory, not uh, regulatory. There has to be some regulations, but you know, it's, it's based on everybody participating and agreeing that this is, this, is, this is the playing field that we're going to be on right now. And I, I find this, um, this, is, this is really huge. And this is not just for Ms. Dool, this is for all of the operators in, in, in the Caribbean. They, they need to start looking at their local communities and, and start to uh, understand how they need to collaborate. If, if they could, if you get some of these people um, who all started to talk, um, some of these operators who are now in, in you know, a head-to-head -head competition, get them all starting to talk and getting on the same page. Can you imagine how quickly some of these environments could turn around? Absolutely. I totally agree. And, you know, especially in the Caribbean, because I just noticed there was a NBC News report that came out this morning online. And it talks about the Caribbean economies are facing peril as the coral reefs decline. It's impacting their their economy and the way that the, the locals can sustain themselves. I mean, they have to feed, clothe, school their children. And if there's, if it's, if the tourism, which brings in so much, so much money to the community, if it's ruined because the reefs aren't being taken care of, because the dive community is a huge part, it's snorkelers, anybody who's, you know, water, you know, wants to go to the beautiful turquoise waters. The gin um, clear waters of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, gin clear waters. And, and actually, that was mentioned about the vibrant coral reef and how it should be. And the, the, from the surface, most people see, all they see is the, is the turquoise. They're mm. not seeing what's happening below the surface. And mm. it, it, uh, I'll send you the link to this, but it's oh. a good news report. Well, this is really fascinating because uh, you know I, I've I've had these conversations with other people around the world, particularly dive operators, and some of them say, you know what, it doesn't really matter what's happening to the coral reefs because we have so many new divers coming online that they don't know the difference. So we just we just keep just we just keep using up the reef. You know, it doesn't it it really isn't impacting us. But this 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 news piece is telling us yes, it is. Get your head out of the sand. This absolutely is impacting your business. It is, um, because it is a huge business in the Caribbean. I mean, you know, again, that's where I cut my teeth on diving, and, and the degradation is just astounding. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, and yet there's still so much that can be done. I mean, it can, with given the right um, support, and that there are areas that can, can recover. They've been showing it can recover. Um, you know, in Mexico, Cabo Pomo is hmm. a perfect example of leaving it alone for a while and watch it come back as rich as it used to be. They can recover. But if we don't do anything about it, you know, shame on us. Shame on us, for sure. Well, you know, I, I wanted to, um, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to name any names, but I, I want you to tell me some of the most appalling things that you've seen. Just <laughs> let's get into the dirt. <laughs> well, you know, again, I think the, the biggest impact for, for me in, in the Caribbean was my experience 30 years later um, mm -hmm. in the Bahamas. And here you have a country that, you know, continues to build giant resorts um, they, you know, in other small areas in the Caribbean where all of these giant cruise ships are negotiating huge money and that to, to come into port and it's, you know, those impacts are just devastating. Um, several years ago, I did an expedition through ILCP where I covered the marine life in Cozumel. And, and of course, the walls on the outside are, are beautiful and stunning, but the impact from 
too much tourism and cruise ships and that really was mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. Um, that and things like, uh, I could get shot for this, but dolphin discovery, um, you know, yeah. that is a, that's another topic. And when I did kind of some investigative work, what I found in several locations of these swim with dolphin programs, and that was that, you know, they're penned, maybe they're penned, it's disgusting. I took a look at, you know, the fence line where the pens were and there was algae growing all over it. And I thought, well, is this coming from the ocean side or where is it coming from? And it actually was impact from their own sewage system. Because when I went into the bathrooms um, to kind of check it out, I had a suspicion that maybe they weren't uh, maintained very well. The bathrooms were disgusting. Half the stuff was, was broken. So you can imagine what the affluence that they're letting out through those dolphin pens and that is creating. You know, it's, it was appalling to me. I was totally shocked. And I think they all need to be banned. But I agree. I agree. I, I totally agree. I I I went to uh, Cancun, you know the 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 Isla shopping place, and they have that that dolphin discovery there, and it 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 made me cry. It made me. I was I was sitting in a restaurant right nearby, and I could hear these dolphins, and it just I. I uh, we can't do this anymore. We just yeah. can't do it. It's just, it's just, it's unsustainable. It's not only unsustainable. It's just, uh, it is absolutely cruel. It is, it is cruel in the utmost, and we can't do it anymore. And, no, we, yeah. So to me, those are the things that you know impacted me the most. Now, uh, here's 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 another thing. Uh, you. Uh, get a chance to travel all around the world and do these I know you do the most beautiful presentations and just recently you were in ADEX uh, in Singapore now ADEX does things quite differently than we do in North America particularly because they're both a consumer and a trade show and this is I think where we're going and I would like you to just walk us through some of the things that ADEX does um, that we as an industry need to take a, a really really close look at because they're, they're doing some really cool things. They really are. Um, and it's, it's a growing uh, consumer show. And I, I was pretty impressed. This was the first time that I went to ADEX. So I have not seen the, the progression over the past uh, few years. But uh, what they did have was they had two stages, a main stage, and then they had the photo zone. And of course, you know, one was specifically to talk about tips and techniques, and then you had all the different uh, um, dive booths, equipment booths, but they were open to the public. And the main stage, where they had a variety of uh, guest lectures, I was so impressed, and it was amazing to see how many people from the public, from the community, interested in diving or already divers, came to listen to um the lectures on conservation and environmental concerns. Absolutely wonderful. I mean, Sharon Kwok, who is one of my idols, um, and speaks quite, um, quite tough to the Asian community about environmental concerns, but she's very respected. And I mean, she filled that whole main stage uh, seating area. And there were others, you know, wonderful people who were talking about issues. Um, so I think that's something that we could offer instead of um, at our own local dive shows and, and DEMA and that is, is, yes, we're all interested in, in learning the new and the latest and greatest uh, photo equipment out and uh, dive equipment out and those kind of things, but we could also open it up more to, to the public. and. By doing that and having lectures on environmental concerns, it could teach the operators as well. You know, because now even if they can't attend a specific lecture, they're streaming a lot of the, the talks online. So I was impressed with, with the way ADEX is, is really trying to be to cover more uh, of um, the dive community. 
And what I like about it is that um, I went to ADEX years ago, uh, but what I like about it is they've been doing uh, this, what is it, the... Um, how many? I can't remember what it is, but it's it's so many days of trade, and then the weekend is for consumer, yes. and and it 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 just works, and yes. and the 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 trade has plenty of time to get together and do their business, and and talk about these tough issues because they're talking about it over there, and 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 then on the weekend it opens up, and then everybody gets together, and and it's great for the operators, and one of the things is that the 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 hallways, the the, are, the the aisles are packed. They're absolutely packed. I mean, I, I you don't see that over here. It'll be interesting to to see what the numbers are. I don't, I don't think John Tett, who organizes um, ADEX, has the numbers in from from the recent show. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure there's been an increase of participation, and now it's starting. There, you know, there's there's more news going out. I just think. I mean, shoot, Dima is in Las Vegas, D Dima is in Orlando. These are, you know, destination places that, you know, even a, a, a new diver might want to come see, you know, some of the information that's being, being set out there. And, and we could provide more. We could talk about issues like conservation, environmental concerns. Um, I just think it's a win-win. Absolutely, absolutely. No, this is really exciting to see that 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 other people are, are are following this model, and they seem to be winning. and And we need to listen up. I I really think we do. And I know that you are heading to PNG very shortly. So I I, I want to ask you, PNG is is a very uh, remote location. Is it being impacted by diving yet? Um, I have yet to see. You know, the, the impact that I saw was many years ago, and it was when they had a huge temperature spike and coral bleaching going on. And that happened around 1998. Um, the reef, fortunately, has totally recovered, totally recovered. But it's such a minuscule number of people that go to that area. Let's face it. I mean, we're divers going to Papua New Guinea and some of those remote locations, very, very small numbers. So the impact, it really isn't... Uh, too big, and there's not a plethora. There's only of, of liveaboard dive boats going out there. There's only a couple. I worry about some of the areas um, that ha may have such great numbers of dive boats. Now you're putting, you know, the numbers are higher, so you're going to have some impact. I think one of the interesting things is that yes, as divers, we need to be concerned about how we. Uh, dive these reef, you know, and the continuous training on buoyancy control and what, you know, as photographers, what we do needs to constantly be, you know, reminding the guests. And it can be done without, a, without using a, a hammer. It can be done just as good reminders on good diving practices. Uh, so, but it's, you know, actually we're Divers can be a small percentage. I saw some numbers uh, a couple years ago, and, and actually diver impact is, is not a huge percent. That doesn't mean we don't pay attention. We have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other things that are doing so much more damage to, to the reefs, and, and that's the you know, overfishing, uh, destructive fishing pa um, practices, things like that that are, that are going on, the affluence in the Caribbean from all these giant resorts, cruise ships. Uh, so, yeah. I think it probably depends on carrying capacity, too, because if there's not a lot of divers on the reef, you know, it, it d tends not to get impacted as much. But when you have a whole bunch of people on the reef, uh, it's, 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 it absolutely has to get impacted. It does. Yeah. And one of, of the things that I came across is that, um, you know, there's, there's talk, there's the talk about photographers. Can we talk? <laughs> About us being such mashers. Yes, but here's the here's 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 a catch twenty two for you. Um, uh, di uh, photographers, underwater photographers, stay in the industry much longer. They you know they, they don't drop out as soon as they start investing in camera gear. They're they're in the industry. So uh, you know, uh, resort operators, level board operators, they love them because they are going to have repeat guests. These people don't drop out the way the rest of the people do. So how do we uh, 
guide photographers so that they don't mash up the reefs. Is there a book? Is there, is, do you, you must teach this or do you teach this when you do your presentations about photography? Don't like, this is how you need to get your shot, but not mash up the reef. First and foremost, you know, out of the box, anytime I'm, I'm speaking to students um, and people wanting to get into underwater photography, you know, first of all, I have a whole list. One, I want you to become a good diver first. Uh, I see so many people, you know, who, oh boy, they're, they're past their open water. They're out there. They've got 15, 20 dives under their belt. Now give me a camera. And uh, quite frankly, I don't really want to see, um, it's my recommendation to have a good solid uh, at minimum of 50 dives under your belt. Get your buoyancy uh, where you know what you're doing with your equipment before you put a camera in your hands because that's when the accidents happen. And yeah. we're all guilty. Uh, I mean, there are times things happen, but you want to give it your best. Um, and again, it all comes from, ooh, do I need to go back to square one and, and check out my buoyancy skills? You know, I've got several thousand dives, and there are times that I have to reach reevaluate that because I may have changed to a different piece of equipment. It may change my buoyancy. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that it doesn't hurt to for any of the operators to, to you know, explain that. And it can be done in a in a positive way. You need to write a book, Michelle. Yeah. And get get all of what your favorite. You need to get all your favorite photographers to get to put together a book, or your conservation photographers to put together a, like a little guide that that says, you know, uh, listen up. This is this is this is what we believe needs to happen. This is how we operate. Um, we try. Well, this is this is our guidelines, and this is what we, uh, you know. And that's, that's actually a good idea because I think, you know, social media is, has, and is a good way to, to send that message. I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, everybody's on social media in some fashion. So I see a lot more talk about that, but I also see a lot more finger pointing. And sometimes, you know, because you'll get all of a sudden, maybe somebody photographs somebody, you know, touching or whatever. It, I think there are better ways than throwing it up and finger pointing and being mean and nasty about it and, and engaging people that's more instructive. You know, yeah, as part of your book, this just came to my head, as part of your book, and take notes please, as part of your book, you need to give guidelines for operators as to how to portray um, their, their, uh, their reefs and how to, how to function underwater. Uh, I noticed you, know, you see you still see pictures of people sitting in barrel sponges. You still, I mean, we're, we're getting you're giving away you know these the the wrong impression. At Dima, not this past year, but the year before, they had some some uh, uh, what do you what do you call it? A spear gun company, and they had the guy lying in the reef with his collar. Seriously, I didn't. Oh, miss oh, it's unbelievable. So you know we need to have guidelines within our own industry as to what what photography is you know is to be used so we don't give the wrong impression that this is perfectly okay. okay yeah i was unaware of that i'm totally shocked that anybody whether it's a you know uh an area where it's legal to spearfish and and you know we can get into long discussions over spearfishing and impacts on that but just from a basic um respect for her for the coral reefs and where you are i just can't even imagine it was, I, it, oh it's like the whole the whole length of this one wall of this booth at, at dima i was i was that, just shocked. That, that is an uninformed operator and and even when you're doing presentations okay put this on your list even when you're doing presentations <laughs> my long term story <laughs> <laughs> that you know that showing showing uh, appropriate diver behavior not having all this gear hanging off and you know rubbing on the reef we still see that in 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 consumer presentations yeah so it's it's it is a problem and we're sending the wrong the wrong uh, the mess the wrong message out to people and and I would love 
I would love, I would love, I would love for, for photographers to be part of the solution. You're part of the solution. You're doing amazing work with the International League of Conservation Photographers. And, and I would love this to spread out to those bazillion of recreational photographers who stay in the industry, uh, stay diving. We need to get them on board so they know that there's, there are rules of the road, rules of the fin, whatever. Well, and I think we have some excellent outlets for doing just that kind of piece as well. You know, I mean, there's, there's wet pixel dive photo guide. There's a variety of places that, you know, um, might make this suggestion to them. Let's do a sample of, uh, from the photographers that are, you know, I mean, there's some great people out there, Amanda Cotton, there's, you know, yeah, just amazing uh, photographers out there and each one, let's do, let's do a story. You know, what do you do? How do you address um, if you have clients? Yeah, we can do a great story there. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're headed to PNG and, and you're doing something that's not even underwater. Can you just no tell dive us? Gear. What's that? No dive gear, sadly, on this trip. <laughs> I know, but it, this is actually, go. this actually speaks to, um, you're talking about this, it actually speaks to, um, uh, the society and and myths about society. You're doing this headhunt revisited, and um, people don't really understand uh, exactly what you're doing. So can you please explain this because it's it is very very cool. You know, it is my passion project, and although it has the story itself has nothing to do with marine life and reefs and and all of that, I. I became engaged uh, about culture from my diving, going to, after about the fourth or fifth time to Papua New Guinea, uh, diving all the beautiful reefs. Uh, it, I noticed when I raised, and I say this in all my lectures, when I raised my head above the surface, I noticed the people along the shore. And they were as culturally diverse as the marine life was on the reefs. And I couldn't help myself. I became very, very connected to the different communities and fascinated with the culture. And, and they all, especially the coastal tribes, rely on the health of the reefs for their sustainability, you know, for their villages. And it was late in the late 1990s, a friend of the family, of my family, was dying of cancer. And I went to say my goodbyes to Marie and she had this beautiful library of books and she handed me this book titled New Guinea Headhunt that was authored by Caroline Meidinger and published in 1946 and she said Michelle I know how much you love that part of the world and I think there's a bit of you in here so I didn't read the book for several months but when I did I was astounded and discovered that she had another book about the first half of her journey so let's cut to the chase. Who was Caroline Meidinger? She was an American woman artist who traveled to Melanesia with another uh, female friend, Margaret Warner. They were young and they spent four years over there painting portraits of the tribe's people that they, they met um, and wrote two books. And they did this between 1926 and 1930. So it's like, can you imagine two young American women going to such a remote part of the world? And, and trust me, they were on, you know, cushy liveaboard dive boats with air conditioning. Uh, they were hopping Copra vessels and freighters, you know, to get from one uh, location to the next. But she came home with 25 oil paintings and a myriad of sketches that are stunningly beautiful and are ethnographic details. So my documentary film is to bring her story back into public view because she's, she hasn't, all of her paintings have been put away and created and no one has seen them in the public uh, since about 1935. And her story has been forgotten. So that's what the documentary film is. Where, 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 are the, where are the crates? The paintings are, she was very careful on where the paintings went before she passed away um, in 1980 at the age of 83. And uh, she left them with the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So they're in the warehouse with about 3 million other pieces of art. 
and um, you know wanting to tell this story through documentary film is is my passion goal and of course I did an expedition uh, 10 years ago retracing Caroline's footsteps and what did I use? I used the MV Fabrina, my friends in, oh. in Papua New Guinea. The so the people. Fa Fabrina was home base. We spent a year mapping the locations where Caroline went, and I had a, a Nat Geo Discovery Channel shooter, an audio man. I had a Papua New Guinean anthropologist, Dick Doyle, who um, you know lives in the Witus, was our historian. Dickie has since passed away. Um, but he was instrumental in helping pull it all together, and we went and retraced her footsteps for two months. So you're still in the dive industry. You're still doing yep. the dive industry, even though I had nothing. It's just it's it, we're all connected. It's all connected. All people. connected. Everything is connected. Everything is connected, oh. and you know it's from whether it's marine life photography and the beauty of um, cultural photography or oil on canvas. You know, art can connect people across oceans and decades, and it can tell stories, and it can remind people of, you know, of how delicate our Earth is in so many ways. And, in, and, in, and nowadays, art is getting the message across much greater than, than textbooks and whatever. What you're doing is helping to get the message across what's going on through your art, through your photography, through your, your, your documentary. All, this, is, this, is, this is the way now. This is the way to get the message out to a, a, a broader, a much broader public audience. And it's, it's very exciting. And it's very exciting. And get this. I, I love this. So the fact that we now have in collaboration on this documentary film, we wanted the voice of uh, a Melanesian especially an artist. And I was introduced to a, a young man, Jeffrey Feger, who is a portrait artist and is Papua New Guinean. And he does stunning work. So he's collaborating with us. But what I'm learning even more is that there are some incredibly talented artists, you know, painting out there. And they're starting to tell stories about the marine environment on canvas, about um, the beautiful uh, and, and some of the impacts that uh, globalization is having, you know, more uh, logging or overfishing, and they're doing it through their art. So how incredible is that? This is, this. is I think this is going to get the attention of people more so than us saying, don't do this, don't do that. This is, this is, this is the way of the future is, is through, through art, through movies, through documentaries, through, through images. Um, and speaking about them, being uh, you know, being a good speaker, I've I've seen you up the, in, on the stage and telling your stories, and people are just wowed. And in fact, it was Anne Hassel at Aggressor Fleet said, "You better get Michelle on that summit." <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, my dear, happy trails to you. Thank you. You're away for a month, and uh, look forward to hearing what happens with your headhunt revisited. I know it's, it's going to be some more pickup shooting, but I'm also leading a, a photography tour for cultural photography, and I, I enjoy that very much. And we still will be, I'll be at you know, some of my favorite dive resorts, and I have guests that are staying on to go diving, but we're there to learn about the people. So it's very cool. I'm very excited. Diving is a very social sport, so this makes total sense. Yes. All right. Listen, you have a great trip. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Laurie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.